now's about where the trade market really starts to yeah. reveal itself and to become hypercharged. So probably each week on Crunch Time from here, we, we'll dedicate a little bit of time to, to come up to speed with what's known and then what's been speculated upon. Yeah, and I think we would have sat, well, I don't think, I know, we would have sat here at this time last year and spoken about the tumbleweeds that were about to blow through yeah. the, the exchange period, and that was exactly how it came to be. Well, it's the exact opposite this time around, Jared. So if... The smoke uh, that's building at the moment um, is, is anything to go by. There's going to be a fair few flames during the exchange period of, of contracted players moving clubs. That's the industry talk well and truly abuzz at the moment with just how much movement there is going to be. So Collingwood, uh, GWS and Kilda, Geelong, Melbourne, Fremantle, all looking like they'll be active for very different reasons. Now, I, I think if we're talking about the most high-profile player at the moment that's that's in the, um, in the speculation basket, it certainly is Luke Jackson at, at Melbourne, who have gone from supreme confidence about keeping him to a, a I guess a, a way to phrase it is a growing concern and I mean the facts are if we just strip away all the speculation if you're an unsigned player at this point in the season um, the percentages would say you're more inclined to announce you're leaving to a rival club as opposed to staying I think that's just the the back, bare facts at the matter at the moment and we're seeing that with someone like Liam Baker as well at, at Richmond so uh, what we do know is that Melbourne are absolutely in the hunt for a key forward. We spoke about this yesterday. Now, whether that's because they know Luke Jackson's leaving or they were going down this path anyway, they have tried and failed to get a few key forwards on the hook so far this year, and they're absolutely asking around for one now. So that that I, I think there's a if you're playing the percentages again, Rory Lobb almost certain to leave Fremantle. He tried 12 months ago. They couldn't orchestrate it. Everything we hear is that he's well and truly wanting to move this year, 12 months on, does he potentially end up at Melbourne? And this is hypothetical scenario with Luke Jackson going out and Rory Lobb comes in. Are they intertwined in a trade in some way, shape or form is a scenario that, that, that might play out come the end of the season. Do you think Leon Luke Jackson is a smart buy for Frio at this point of the rebuild? Or not that they've done the rebuild at this point of the moving into the pointy end contention? Oh, purely if I'm, I've got Fremantle's hat on, absolutely. Um, he's a homegrown, and, and it's always hard, the speculation. And you you said, Sam, before, mm. when a lot of players haven't signed by now, the percentages are <clears throat> they will go. And you're probably right. In my time at the Giants, a lot of the guys that had that speculation throughout the year, Cornelio, Kelly, they signed at the end. Yeah. Through the finals, because... And I, it's hard. You can't win either way because if you say I'll do it at the end of the year and I'm really comfortable where I'm at, um, a lot of players actually just don't want to think about it until the final siren goes. There'll be some, you know, pre preliminary talk and you know some rough figures to say, listen, here's your three or four year deal or five year deal, whatever. But, but I don't want to think about that and say yes or no until a week after I finish. And I've seen that happen. But I understand that, that the more percentages are, the, the players will go if they haven't signed. But there is still the classic case of players signing at the end of the year. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of the Jackson one, Jared, he does, I mean, does fit the bill. If they're thinking, I mean, they're the only ones that know. If they think there's unrest or, um, you know, I know there was, you know, speculation that Rory Lobb was, you know, going to the Giants last year. And we did clearly were chasing him hard um, and it didn't come through and so does he want to move across because his girlfriend's in Melbourne and all that sort of stuff there's always that speculation so you then have to you're in that real hard position well we need to replace him mm. we need to get someone else and if we're in the window it's not as if we're down at 18th you know we're not just going to the draft or we, we've already got our eye on a free agent so we have to and so flip flip it over and Melbourne well, if they think that Jackson might be going, then they have to get on the front foot and say, OK, well, we are clearly in the window. Do we just go, well, OK, we need to get lob, or do we need to uh, try to get McStay from Brisbane? And all that sort of stuff starts happening right now. And the only way to engage in those conversations is when the season's on, even though the player might be saying, I'll deal with this at the end. Yep. And the formal word just on that from the Luke Jackson camp is that the player just simply has not made up his mind. And, and, and when he does, uh, uh, obviously they'll go down that path, Jared. And and I, I understand then they start digging deeper, Sam. Mm. I think what you got a house in Frio and he hasn't <laughs> rented it out and I read all the stories. Yeah. Well, I think 95% of the Giants <laughs> players had houses in Melbourne, if yeah. you know what I mean, but they've stayed up here for 10 or 12 years. So I think 
people will start reaching and things like that. Yeah, but yeah. You, he might need. We might just say, no, I want to deal with this after we finish our final series. You, you never hear about AFL players buying property until this time oh, of I the year, Jerry. The real estate tie-in is yeah. my favourite tie-in. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> who else is on your list? Well, the Age reported during the week that Essendon have met with Angus Brayshaw, who has a big free agency decision to make. Now, speaking like Leon says of players who have t- taken their time with contracts and then ended up just signing to stay put, Angus Brayshaw perhaps would be among Exhibit A with that sort of stuff. But I just wonder where what decision... It's a it's a curious one from an Essendon point of view, given the emergence of Coldwell, the emergence of, of Ben Hobbs, the midfield depth they have in that part of the ground. And then that's offset by the fact they finally made an offer to Dyson Heppel, their captain. Now, will he remain captain is a whole other topic of conversation, but will he even remain at the club? Now, I wouldn't shut the door on the fact that he might move the contract offer from Essendon to Dyson Heppel um, isn't what you would call supremely attractive, Jared. So... Um, it would appear to be a, a stay strictly on our terms sort of an offer. So Dyson Heppel, there is some rival interest there about bringing him across to another club, at least maybe one or two clubs on a in a leadership group mentor sort of role, um, playing as a halfback flanker. So there's that one. Essendon, we know, have asked the question of Isaac Rankin. In fact, put a very lucrative contract offer to Isaac Rankin, but we are led to believe that he will well and truly stay put at the Gold Coast Suns, which says a lot about the changing environment at Gold Coast, doesn't it? That the players were almost clawing over themselves to get out and now they're doing the exact opposite to stay and, and Stuart Jew, as we know, has, has recommitted there as well. And then there's Colin we haven't even got to yet yeah, either. So what's, what do you think the Brody Grundy scenario is? I think he stays, to be honest. I, I just, uh, if if Collingwood have it in their mind that they would canvas a trade for him, his management know nothing about it, and neither does the player who's been thrust into an awkward situation. Certainly not a case of Brody Grundy wanting to move like he had entertained so strongly before signing a lucrative offer. Um, he was well and truly happy to move to Adelaide. There were portions of Collingwood who were happy to facilitate that as well before the powers that be from a couple of rungs above the football department said, no, 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 this guy has to stay. And and he did. So he's got five years to run at a million dollars a season. So can you possibly see a scenario where they pay another player to pay play against them like they have with Adam Trelaw? It's a it's a pretty big bridge to cross. Yeah. It, even if it could save them seven hundred thousand dollars in the cap when we speak about other players they might bring in, Taranto, McStay and the like. Yeah, I can see it more readily than you can from our conversation, obviously. But so none of the people who re sign him are there anymore? None. Yep. Which is real, which is interesting in its own right. Is so, I'm so curious about this one, Leon. So five years, five million still to run. At his best, he was one of the the two who was fighting for all Australian ruckman with with Max Gorn. It doesn't seem to me like he's done an awful lot wrong. He had a he didn't have the year that he would have hoped for last year, and then he's been injured for most of this. That his his downgrade in in some people's minds, I, I must admit, I find curious. I find it fascinating because uh, Brody Grundy is clearly in the same um, mm. category as Max Gorn, and um, he's an outstanding ruckman. Um, but I, I suppose the the interesting point that you made there is the people that signed Brody Grundy are not there, and so the incoming people, Graham Wright, your new coach, um, who else is there at the moment? They might say, well. Uh, we've gone down a different path. Our style of play is different. Uh, another emerging ruckman has come through in Darcy Cameron, um, and the only way to get someone else into our footy club is to move someone out. That's the that'll be a classic conversation they would be having in their list management. But equally, they would keep checking themselves and saying, "Hey guys, are we? Um, why are we talking about Brody Grundy? Um, they're really hard to get. Yeah, um, they're extremely hard to get. And when you get two of them on your list." And some, and they can be competent playing forward. Have a look at what Melbourne did last year, and um, having two big men that can ruck and go forward. Now we haven't probably seen that side of Grundy go forward yet, but maybe that was the grand plan this year before he got injured with with Darcy Cameron, and that might have progressed throughout the year. So hard enough to get. So I find it intriguing um, that it is discussed that much, because um, he's one hell of a ruckman. If he, if you could add Brody Grundy to your list at six hundred thousand, that would be one of the, in my opinion, yeah, one yeah. of the all-time trade period steals. The other part of it is what happens if he does go, and then Darcy Cameron, Mason Cox is in your absolute long-term planning as well. So if something does go wrong with Darcy Cameron, is there a fallback plan? 
And as Leon says, having two quality ruckmen, the damage that it can cause. And Brody Grundy's got to sanction the trade as well. Albeit that's slightly naive thinking, given the Adam Trelaw scenario. When a club wants yeah. you out, generally you're going out. All right, so the, the last one, you're free to sidestep this one or engage, Leon, but it's the Giants scenario that's before us, Sam. Yeah, it was reported during the week by Sam McClure that they're facing, I think he used the term, uh, another exodus. So it's, uh, look, oh, and Leo will know this, all clubs who have contended or who are contending are obviously pushing the limits as far as they can with the cap, you know, that, that's par for the course. So the names that have come up, uh, Jacob Hopper, who who is contracted, Tim Tarando isn't, Tanner Bruin, um, uh, Bobby Hill as well, who are course, a bit like uh, Rory Lobb wanted to move 12 months ago and it didn't quite work out. So um, we, we take it at face value. Jason McCartney is, is on the record as saying it's going to be a, a pretty volatile trade period himself, uh, obviously, uh, up there at GWS. So will that involve the Giants and how many can they keep and how many are they happy to get rid of as um, fits into the speculation basket at, at the moment, doesn't it? Is it the cycle, Leon, that this club just through its construct and its geography is is just bound to live over and over? Yeah, I mean, ideally you don't want it to live over and over, Jared, because um, it's it's unresting. You can't, you know, clearly go year in, year out and say, OK, I know I've got a similar squad from last year to this year to the next year because of the, the challenges you had. And, and then there's always, there's going to be a story written on this regardless because it's happened before. In 2020... You know, there was Core, Cameron and Williams gone. And in 2018, it was Scully, Shiel and Patton. So if you actually look at it, it's normally around that three-player mark. And uh, to hold players up here in a, in, a, in a growth market has been challenging. Everyone knows that. So what is being written, everyone knows. Mm. And you, you, but somewhere along the line, you want to have that, not stability, just that continuity. And um, if that means one or two players have to go this year just to make sure that the cap's under control and where they understand, I mean, that's up to the, you know, the giant management to make sure that they get that right if one or two players have to move on to get their cap under control or they are thinking about adding a ruckman or a forward or a back or whatever they may be doing. Um, that's going to play out and it's going to be real intriguing again.